So let's get going. I want to start with Bruce's conclusions, plus one that I added to the list. Do you remember his slide that said, perception controls behavior? Very powerful words coming, especially from a biologist. Perception controls the genes. Perception rewrites genes. And where I'm going with this is perception also rewrites behavior. I expect there's just uh, two or three of you in the room maybe that might have a few behaviors you'd like to rewrite. Uh, I certainly did, especially 14 years ago. And so my search was to find the easiest, uh, sanest, most effective, and quite frankly, the, the most painless way to do it. Uh, graduate school didn't teach me about the painless part. In fact, it was all about go back, find the pain, work through the pain, and that's the only way to change your beliefs. Uh, I do have a different story to tell you at this point, uh, quite, a, quite a lot different than that schooling. The thing about perception, because Bruce used the word a lot and then he squeezed it together with the word uh, belief, I'd like to make a little bit of a distinction there for us uh, this evening. Perception, in my opinion, is awareness. The dictionary calls it awareness, but it's shaped by belief. Belief actually precedes perception. And I'm going to be talking about how that happens, but the important fact about it is that beliefs control your perceptions. If you rewrite the beliefs, you can rewrite perception. And if you rewrite the perception, you can rewrite the genes and the behavior. So there really is no distinction, if you're in the healing arts, especially the complementary ones, between mind and body. It's just a different expression of us, who we are. I want to define beliefs as a working definition anyway in the following way. Beliefs are conclusions derived from experience, and, uh, information and or experience. They can be either conscious or subconscious. And what I mean by this, let me give you an example. Beliefs uh, derived by conclusions from information would be the kind of thing that would happen if you got jury duty and you weren't at the event that's being tried, let's say it's a criminal case, you weren't there present when the so-called crime was committed, but you're sitting in a jury situation. You're now required to listen to information from two attorneys telling you their story, getting you ultimately to come to some truth, some level of belief about what happened in that event you couldn't attend. So you're creating a belief through information alone. The second version of that is experience. Uh, typical experience is, say, you're two years old, imagine, and you've never experienced... Uh, fire before. So you're crawling around and there's a candle left on and you're getting curious because you haven't had an experience with a candle or fire yet. So as uh, most kids that are two years old, they'll move towards anything they don't understand to discover what it is. So you move closer and closer to that candle and isn't it interesting, so you stick your little hand out like you do with everything else to touch it and grab it and see what it is like and sure enough, you get burned. Well, as soon as you get burned, you've had an experience. Now it's not just curiosity that's associated with that candle. There's an experience and a conclusion that is drawn from touching that fire, which turns into a belief, which ultimately, as I'll, as I'll show you, affects your future perception of candle. In the beginning, there's not much uh, of a differentiated perception, but in, after an experience like that, there certainly is. And then the, uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about the conscious and subconscious mind, because this is where, in my opinion, the greatest amount of ignorance exists in mainstream psychotherapy is that we've been trying to work, uh, trying to change subconscious beliefs uh, with lots of conscious means. And it turns out the two minds are so different that it's no wonder it doesn't work very well. Your beliefs actually determine your biological and behavioral reality. If I had to, to just describe Bruce's presentation in total in one statement, this would be it. Virtually every part of our lives is governed by our belief systems. And we'll talk about that a little more too. Do you remember this slide? Here's the filter representing our belief systems. And if you look at it from this point of view, it's really a powerful thing to witness. Beliefs are really the filters of reality. You don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are. In fact, you can't not do that. It's the most interesting thing is that each of you sitting out there looking at this presentation are actually having a very different experience of it. You all have the illusion it's the same experience. You'll talk about having been here, but it's not the same experience for you at all. Your set of filters about who I am, what I'm saying, where this place is, how you're feeling right now, that all profoundly affects your experience of this evening. So you think, well, it was a fact. Here's what happened. 
but then you start talking to your friend that you came with or someone else that attended this particular uh, event, they had a very different experience. So it's always that way. And if you can remember that, as soon as you're thinking, well, I've got the facts straight about something, remember, the facts are your subjective opinion, your filters of reality. And that's what, that's what perceptions are all about. That's what really matters here. Beliefs create perceptions, and they affect virtually every area of your life, as I mentioned. Self-esteem, for instance. I mean, your perceptions either define you as worthy or worthless in relationships, either loved or, or unloved. Uh, with respect to prosperity, that's a pretty popular one. You either can attract money easily in, the, in your life, or your perception is it's hard to get and hard to keep, and you'd mismanage it anyway. Uh, you look at your job performance, if your perception of yourself as, as a competent person or an incompetent person, it's going to make a heck of a lot of difference in terms of how you perform your job and also the perception of others, of course. Mental health, you can see yourself as generally a happy person or a depressed one. Physical health, I mean, Bruce's presentation makes that pretty clear. The psychology profoundly impacts the biology of the body. Spiritual outlook, we have so many different spiritual systems and ways of looking at the hologram of God, so to speak, and all of the facets of it that uh, it is about perception when we're looking that causes us to, uh, to believe and act in the way we do. And, of course, the list goes on and on. You remember this slide? This is our friend Ecstasy. She represents joy. She represents growth in Bruce's model, moving towards something that's pleasurable. Do you remember this one? The scream, it's called. So this one, of course, represents protection and fear. So my question to you is, if you had a choice, if you could choose between living like this, having your life and the undertone of your life being this feeling that you get when you look at this, or this, which would you choose? Oh, no, let's review again. <laughs> It's a tough choice. Would it be her or would it be him? All right, if you're having any trouble uh, uh, deciding here or if you've decided you'd prefer this one, I only have one recommendation. See your doctor immediately and get your medication adjusted. Because under normal conditions, people are going to pick her. We want uh, consciously to have our lives work. We want the life, our lives to be filled with joy and pleasure and to look forward to each day. What prevents us from doing that? What is really the bottom line cause? How, do we, how, it is, how is it that your life maybe doesn't represent as much of this ecstasy as you'd like to it, have it represent right now? And I'll propose to you that what Bruce was telling you was absolute truth, and I'm just going to add a little bit to it. Whether you're living in growth and protection makes all the difference in the world. What determines that? Well, I can messages as a child versus I can't messages are one of the big ways that that determination happens. If you receive more positive input from your environment, generally your parents, for instance, and you were told that you were lovable, you were told that you could accomplish anything, you were told you were good enough, you were told that you were wonderful, then you're probably having a life that reflects that more now than anybody could imagine versus if you were told more I can't messages. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. You're not smart enough. All those things that's, that many of us heard. Those go in just like experiences. Those are experiences. They're just information driven. They're parentally induced usually, reinforced by society. And so we end up with a series of experiences that either put us primarily in growth or protection from our perception of life. Turns out our childhood programming becomes our habits of perception and behavior. You get your programs early on. By about five years old, the psychologist will tell you, your personality is pretty well set. What they mean by that is, you've had enough experiences to draw conclusions about yourself, and now you're either lo looking at yourself through the growth or protection filters. The good news is, even if you have produced these filters and you have habits that are supporting the perceptions and the behaviors that you don't want, they are changeable. They are changeable. Habits are usually the things that bug us the most because, most because they, are, they are what they are. Habits are things that happen out of your conscious awareness. It doesn't seem like you have any control over them. You consciously try to control the habit. You say you're not going to do something, but you do it anyway. So I want to explain to you how the cycle of habituation occurs, why it occurs, 
and then ultimately how you can break that cycle. These cycles are really self-reinforcing, and let me see if I can explain this to you. I'm going to use the candle as a model because we talked about that earlier. If you're two years old and you're having your first encounter with fire, and it happens to be connected to a candle, and you crawl over to this fire, and it's a very interesting thing. You've not formed any opinions about candles or fire yet because you've never touched anything that was hot, and now you do for the first time. All of a sudden, you've got an experience. The experience is hurt, ouch. That shapes a perception. The candle's no longer a general thing. Now it's a thing that could create pain. You have a perception of the candle. The perception creates a belief that candles are dangerous, or at least fire is dangerous. You've got it connected to the candle, but the main thing is the fire. That perception then shapes your experience of this candle. The experience reinforces the beliefs. What happens is, the next time you see a candle, instead of crawling over to it and sticking your hand in the candle, your perception of the candle as a possible source of pain keeps you from doing that. The fact that you are not going to go over there and stick your hand in that, in that candle again, it, you'll never again have the same nebulous sort of perception. You're going to have a very specific perception of candles and you're going to watch out for it. Now whether as a child you learned about hot from sticking your hand in the fire and you got burned that way, or as you get older you have more complex experiences, you get burned in other ways. You get burned in relationships as they say. That's a very complex form of burn, but it's a burn nevertheless. And it usually leaves a mark so that when you, next time when you look at that situation, whether it's a relationship or whatever it was where you got hurt, you're going to move away from that. You're going to move into protection. And it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So some of the good cycles, like learning that fire is hot and to keep your hand out of it, is wonderful. You don't want to interrupt those cycles. But what about the cycles of self-deprecation? What about the cycles that say you're not good enough? What about the cycles that aren't very generative, that you'd like to get rid of? Then it would be important to be able to break the cycles. Basically, breaking the cycle amounts to rewriting the software of your mind, because then you can change the printout of your experience. As Bruce said so eloquently, it's about your perception. If you can change how you perceive the environment, essentially how you can perceive yourself in the environment, you can change the environment. You'll be treated differently the second you treat yourself differently. We're told that, you know, day in and day out by all the positive thinkers, but they stop at that part. And then what do you do? Well, there is a something you can do, but how do you do it? It requires two things, really, information and tools. I'm going to give you a little bit more information and then we'll get to the tool part. And please understand that with respect to the tools and the confines of my situation tonight, which is one hour, not two days in a workshop, I'll be able to hopefully demonstrate at least one of the psyche change processes that I've developed over the years uh, so that you can get an idea of how quickly uh, a belief you may have had all of your life actually can change and how you can verify that it's different uh, as, as soon as it changes. So we'll be doing both things. Now one of the key pieces of information you need to be aware of that makes all the difference in the world is that you don't have one mind, you have two. I mean, haven't you ever tried to change your mind only to find out your mind is a mind of its own? <laughs> bet you have. And I'll bet you, you relate to some of these things down here, the ways in which people try to do that. If you've ever promised yourself you'd get in shape, but then you didn't. Ever made a New Year's resolution you didn't keep? Ever try to quit smoking? Try to stop procrastinating? That's a favorite one. You swore you'd never get involved with another relationship, but you do. And the list goes on, and you can fill in your favorite personal one down there about what you've tried to change, and you said you wanted to change it, so there's a conscious intention, a commitment. You're a bright, energetic, committed person, but somehow it just doesn't come off. It doesn't happen, even with your intention focused in that direction. Let me give you a little rundown on how different those two minds are because this is very important in understanding the nature of how change can take place very quickly and why it's been so difficult with the tools we've been given for the past 35 years, which are mostly positive thinking, affirmations, willpower, that sort of thing. I don't know about you, I tried them all. You know, they worked maybe 20% of the time, very frustrating, but it was best we had at the time, so people kept doing it. Just say your affirmations, just do that meditation, just do it over and over and over again. The problem was, it's, it turns out, we were mostly talking to the wrong part of the mind that's in charge of habits, in charge of the change. Look, conscious mind's volitional. It sets goals, judges results, and it likes to try new things. That's the one that says, hey, there's something good happening, let's go out and do it. Let's go into an environment we've never been in. Let's ride the killer roller coaster. 
Let's do a bungee jump. You know? It's the one that would say, hey, that's a great idea. But your subconscious mind didn't like that at all. Subconscious mind says, it's busy monitoring the operations of your body. Basic things like motor functions, heart rate, digestion. And it prefers the familiar. It's the part of you that likes to play it safe. It wants to know what's going to happen in the next moment. It doesn't want something new to contend with. Its basic job is to keep you alive and safe. So why would it want to bungee jump or get on a roller coaster? It's not interested in that. So remember, volitional and habitual. Two different components of you completely. The conscious mind thinks abstractly. It's conceptually based. The subconscious mind thinks literally. It sees the world through your five senses. Bruce mentioned the five senses. You're going to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. That's the only way the subconscious mind can know reality. The conscious mind is the one that reads all those self-help books. It's the one that says, yeah, aren't we inspired? Let's go for it. It's got all of that energy about uh, what you're going to do. It thinks up all those really great ideas. But without communicating the ideas to the subconscious mind uh, adequately, you usually don't go anywhere. You get very excited. You ever been to motivational speeches? I mean, just plain, flat motivational speeches. I mean, when I was in the corporate world, boy, we just did a lot of those. And I'd go into those things, and they'd just whip you into a frenzy. I was clapping and stomping and yelling and screaming, and I was so happy. And then as soon as that motivational speaker left, so did the motivation. <laughs> if you didn't get him or her to come back, which is the point of it, of course, <laughs> if you come back and get that fixed, you'd get cranked up again. But there's a better way to do that. There's a better way to get to that place and to stay there. And it has nothing to do with motivation, actually. The conscious mind is responsible for short-term memory. The subconscious mind for long-term memory. Now, the short-term memory has a little trick to it. I don't know if you know this, but it's an interesting fact. The average length of short-term memory in human beings is about 20 seconds long, short-term memory. Now, I thought that was really interesting because do you know how long it takes to look a phone number up in a phone book, take the coins out of your purse or pocket, and get them into a machine and dial that? 25 seconds. God's little trick. Yeah. So you can't quite pull that off in short-term memory. The subconscious mind is a very important uh, aspect of this change process that I'm going to be sharing with you because it is responsible for long-term memory a critical element. If you get up in the morning and you've forgotten basic things that you learned when you were a child, oh, like, say, walking, you know, things like that, uh, driving as an adult, you have to relearn everything every morning when you got up. So you don't have to do that. You can thank your subconscious mind because it remembers all of those things. It's taken all of that conscious learning and turned it into habitual understanding. Think about driving for a minute. You know, when you first learned how to drive a car, how many learned on a stick shift? I'm just curious. Are you old enough to have? Okay. Yeah, well, me too. And it was a nightmare. I don't know about you, but I'm sitting in, the, in this little car, and I've got a, a gear shift over here. It was on the column. That's how old I am. It was on a column shift, and I got two feet, but there are three pedals. I'm thinking bad engineering right away. You know, it's a problem. What am I going to do with those? Then you've got mirrors. You've got people coming this way, people behind you. You've got to steer the darn thing. You've got a clutch, accelerator, brake. I mean, it was completely overwhelming, not counting my father who was sitting next to me yelling at me the whole time <laughs> because he wanted to save his transmission in that car. And I'm popping the clutch, and it was an awful experience. But eventually, having survived it, I was able to move into an automatic version of driving, and now I don't think about it at all. In fact, most people don't think about driving at all. I noticed since I got here, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very interesting place. <laughs> But you know, the beauty of it is you can have a conversation on the way from point A to point B. You don't remember driving at all. You had a great conversation, but somehow you get there. What's that about? I mean, who's paying attention? Fortunately, you have a very powerful part of you that is paying attention. That's your subconscious mind. That gets you around when you're doing the things that are really fun, and it takes care of most of these baseline things that uh, would uh, consume all our time if we had to do them consciously. All right, the conscious mind is time-bound which means it's past and future based. And for most conscious minds, if you're living with the scream uh, mentality, you spend most of your time regretting your past and agonizing over the future. So that's not very much fun. Your subconscious mind is timeless, however. It thinks in the proverbial present moment only. So when you're talking to the subconscious mind, this fact is very important. It doesn't understand future tense requests. If you put your request of uh, what you want in a future tense for the subconscious, it mostly yawns and goes back to digesting your dinner because he doesn't get it. 
So you have to talk present tense. Now that seems a little crazy from your conscious mind's point of view because it's thinking, well, that hadn't happened yet. If I'm making up this statement that I want to be true, shouldn't I say I want it to be true? Only if you're trying to convince your conscious mind. So there's some rules about how you address and communicate with the subconscious that are very important to making it all work. Another difference, very important one, the conscious mind is, has limited processing capacity, maybe one to three events it can handle at a time. If you're uh, at home and the phone rings and you're watching a TV program and somebody walks in uh, from the, the, the kitchen and they want to talk to you, uh, about that time when those three things are going on, you're saying, wait a minute, one thing at a time, well, you know, I've got to stop now. Because you really can't process. It only is processing at about a rate of 2,000 bits of information per second, which sounds wonderful and, and, and kind of awesome in its own way, unless you compare it to the subconscious mind, who has expanded processing capacity, can process thousands of events at a time, and averages 4 billion bits of processing capacity in a, in a given second. That's, that's an incredible difference. But if you think about it, this part of your mind would have to do that. Remember, it's in charge of motor functions. You can't walk, talk, digest your food, do respiration, digestion, or any of that without a huge amount of processing capacity. You couldn't sit up in your chairs. Because what you take for granted, you just say, well, I'm going to do that. You turn on your volition part, which is your conscious mind, and say, let's walk from here to there. But you know, you can't walk from here to there consciously. If your subconscious mind doesn't agree, you aren't going anywhere. And that's true of your beliefs changing, too. And we're getting to that. All right. It's easier to change habits of thought and behavior if you access the subconscious mind because it's the storehouse for attitudes, values, and beliefs. This is where doing your basic affirmations every day, which are generally so abstract that the subconscious mind can't understand it. It really doesn't care what you're trying to do because you haven't engaged it in any way, shape, or form. And you're talking to the wrong part of the mind in the first place. The subconscious mind is where all these attitudes, values, and beliefs are stored. So if you don't learn how to communicate with it properly, you aren't going to get very far. You're going to be very frustrated. And that's exactly what I was. <laughs> that's why I'm sharing with you these, uh, a, a whole different approach. All right, so as um, the, the, the easiest and most effective way to communicate with the subconscious is, is through a process called muscle testing. And I'll bet you a bunch of you in this room have had some experience with muscle testing. Is that true? Can I see a show of hands? All right. So I'm going to ask you temporarily during this, this uh, discussion and also an experience that I'd like you to have to forget everything you know about it right now. Pretend you don't have any preconceived notions about it. Humor me. There's some things that are very important about using muscle testing in a psychological way that are very different from using it in almost every other way. Vitamin and mineral supplements, it's very popular in applied kinesiology, clinical kinesiology, looking for organ distress, meridian dysfunctions, and so on. I'm not going to be talking about any of that, but I'm going to be talking about some key elements to using it as an accurate measure of what's going on in your subconscious mind, what those beliefs are and what they're not. Okay, we're going to have a little experience and I'm going to ask uh, someone to help me up here to demonstrate uh, muscle testing a la Psyche. Psyche is the name, of the, uh, the name I give the work that I do. And I want to show you when I'm using it as a psychological tool to access the subconscious and check for beliefs, uh, how to set up an appropriate communication system. And the key here is, is, is appropriate. You want to get a true-false uh, message system going. In other words, a conflict detector. The You're measuring the truth between what, you, what your conscious mind says or is affirming and what your subconscious mind believes. Very important to be able to do that credibly. Like-dislike is essentially equivalent to a stress detector. Uh, I learned this one, uh, to use uh, muscle testing in this way, uh, when I got out of graduate school, I was doing sort of mainstream counseling. That's the insight-based talk therapy version where you come in and we sit down together and you tell me all your woes and I nod and say, yeah, that's interesting, tell me more about that. And you do. And then you come back next week and you tell me more about that. And come back next week and you tell me more about that. Well, I got tired of hearing it. They got tired of talking about it. So I figured something's got to change here. And a part of me, which was really the business part, uh, just said, wait a minute, there's got to be some kind of outcome here. I mean, business is all about outcomes, all about bottom line. Turns out therapy, as I was taught in graduate, graduate school, is all about process. You just stay in the process. It's good for you. Oh, where's the part where you get out and get a life? I mean, you know, <laughs> when does it end? Well, apparently it wasn't supposed to end. I never got that. So I thought, well, that's not right. So we're going to do something about that. So in the like-dislike thing, what, what I found was interesting was I'd get people coming in, they'd fill out this intake form, 
And uh, I'd always ask, have you, have you had any other kind of counseling? And was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're putting it down there, 15 years of psychotherapy and all that. <laughs> That's no joke. And they would say, I'd say, okay. So, uh, and they're writing down what their primary uh, presenting problem is, what, what they're trying to deal with. And they just write down stuff about, I said, what, what about your childhood? Tell me about your relationship between your mother and a father, you know. And, so I remember this one client wrote down, yeah, well, I've dealt with my mother, you know, she was very abusive uh, psychologically and physically, and, uh, but you know, I've dealt with that and I'm over it. And I said, oh, that's good. So uh, we, we got to the muscle testing part and I just had her, had her stick her arm out and I was gonna do a little muscle test of stress, stress detector uh, style. And I said, think about your mother. So she did. <laughs> and guess what happened? <laughs> She just crashed and burned. I mean, she was, she was a mess. The muscle response was very clear that just thinking about her mother still stressed her. All of those years of psychotherapy, all of those years of putting together reasons why I've now forgiven my mother, never got to the subconscious mind, which controls the motor functions, which controls the autonomic nervous system, which controls your biology, and ultimately your health. You know, Bruce mentioned, do you remember about the biology and the effect on our immune systems? There are a whole set of beliefs that are immune-enhancing beliefs and a whole set of beliefs that are immune-suppressing beliefs. And if you look at the personality profiles of people who get various diseases, it becomes very interesting in a hurry. There's a whole field called psychoneuroimmunology, about 35 years of study in this country anyway, showing that people, for instance, cancer patients, one of the key um, qualities and attributes, uh, personality characteristics of cancer patients is long-repressed anger and hatred. They're really angry at somebody else, but if you hold that anger inside you, guess where it gets directed? It's your immune system. So the question is, how do you let go of stuff like that? We're going to be getting to that. So third down here is setting up a yes or no communication system because in this work that I do, it's essential that you can communicate with the subconscious in a way to ask it questions and let it determine even what process is going to be used within this model of psyche that I use. There are a variety of belief change processes just as there would be if I was a carpenter and I had my little bag of tools. I'd have a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and a hammer at the very least. Because otherwise if you just handed a hammer and you said go build that house, well you better find a lot of nails because that's all you're going to be able to deal with. So you need some way to communicate a yes or no, um, get yes or no communication from the subconscious. The, the last little note here, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in just a second with someone, is where you position your eyes when you're muscle testing for psychological responses matters, as it turns out. Uh, and I'll show you, I'll demonstrate that for you. Uh, I learned this through, uh, actually this little piece of it, through studying NLP years ago. They had made a big deal out of where your eyes are focused in terms of how you're processing uh, in your brain. And what I found out when I first uh, was introduced to muscle testing as a means of communication it was that sometimes it seemed to answer correctly and sometimes the answers were really bogus and I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And I finally pieced the mystery together and I figured out, wait a minute, sometimes people are saying things, they're having no emotional response to it all. Your arm doesn't operate automatically, it doesn't go strong or weak for no particular reason. If you're not having a response to it internally, then the electrical signal sent from your brain to the muscle has no effect. So I want to show you how that works and then I'd like you to just have an experience of this because when I do a demonstration up here I want you to be wired into what's actually going on and not just watching me do something up here that you're not familiar with. So I would like to invite someone who would uh, like to um, help me demonstrate this muscle testing process to come up. Okay, would you mind? That's great. And you might want to come over here. And you are? Juliet. Juliana, Juliana, if you'll come over here, uh, which arm would you like to use for muscle testing? You most comfortable with this uh, one? Arm. Okay. So let's see if we can get you in some light and me in some light. This is good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate all three of these things, and then I'm going to have you do just one for the sake of time and for your experience. But what I'm doing is I'm standing in next to Juliana's arm, rather than in front of her like this. Uh, I want her to be able to have uh, clear vision over here and me out of her line of fire. Uh, so we're not exchanging too much information in our bio fields right now. <laughs> so Juliana, what I'd like you to do is the following. I'm going to be pressing down on your arm gently. I've got my hand here on your wrist rather than on your hand, and my other hand gently on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to be pressing down. I want you to resist that pressure, okay? okay? But with your eyes, I'd like you to actually put your nose out here in this direction, and your, not your head, but just your eyes focused towards the floor. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm sorry, you can turn your nose over here. You're doing great. And just put your eyes towards the floor and hold them right there. I'm going to press down. Let's just do this together. And I'll tell you before I press because I'm going to say the words be strong, okay? okay? Here we go. Be strong. Good.
good. Now, I'm just calibrating to find out what that's like. Am I pressing OK? It's not too hard. It's not OK. Let's try out some stuff and see what happens. So we're going to go with the first uh, uh, communication link up here. I'm going to have you say something that we know is true about you. And I'm going to ask you to do this one. This is the one that you will do as a, uh, an experiment. So I want you to use your name, because it's something your subconscious probably agrees with, <laughs> unless you're going by an alias. So I want you to look down. And out loud, Juliana, I'd like you to say, my name is Juliana. My name is Juliana. And be strong as I press. Good for you. So let's have you lie now. This is a really important thing. In fact, I'll set this up. If you get away with this and you can keep your muscles strong, everybody out here will give you 20 bucks. Okay. okay. Hey, pretty good, huh? I just spent your money. I hope you're okay. You're rooting for me now, aren't you? Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, again, with your face out here but your eyes towards the floor. Mm -hmm. I want, let's make you um, somebody else completely, like some guy named Bill. We'll make you male. Your name is Bill. So I want you to say out loud like you really mean it. Okay. My name is Bill. All right, my name is Bill. Be strong, Bill. <laughs> and see what happens. I'm pressing gently, but her arm is actually moving down rather than locking in place. I know all of you can't see that exactly, but trust me on this. It's, can you feel the difference? Yes. Yeah, it's dramatic to her and to me, and I'm pressing very lightly. It's not about pressing harder. It's about when she says something that isn't true, roughly, you can rest your arm, roughly what's happening is the equivalent to what happens in a polygraph machine. The brain is actually changing frequencies. The signal is changing. It's going into conflict because there's no file in there, either the gender file, which says she's a female and she's affirming she's male, and the name file crashes because her name isn't Bill, it's Juliana. So two things are going on that create conflict at the brainwave level. The signal, electrical signal from the brain to the muscle is what causes the muscle to go weak. It's not that her muscle mass changes or that I have to press any harder. It's simply a restricted signal because of the confusion, the conflict in the brain. That electrical signal is diminished. The muscle response is much, much weaker. So if you can detect this difference, you can set up this binary code. It's a natural biofeedback mechanism built into every one of us. So if you use it properly, it's very, very wonderful to find out what's going on at levels of your consciousness that you can't find out consciously about. So let's do the next one. Let's uh, do an experiment with like, dislike. So what I'd like you to do is this. I'd simply like you, again, with your face out here, your eyes focused towards the floor. Think of something you like, a circumstance, a situation you really like to be in, and get the feeling of being in it, and then let me know when you're there. I would like to be in it? You would like, yeah. Feeling a situation you'd like to be in. Okay. It can be something you've already done, but you can think about it and go, yeah, I like that. Okay. You got it? Mm -hmm. It'd be real strong. Yeah, she's really strong to that. She likes that a lot. So we won't have you talk about that, okay? Right. Okay. I want you to switch gears. I want you to think of something that you don't like, equally powerful, but the opposite of that pleasant feeling. And take your time and let me know when you've gotten into that feeling. Something you don't like. Oh, you can think of a food or a person or... Okay, okay. Oh, that helped. What, oh, oh. What, was that the person one she was... <laughs> okay. Take your time. You have to get into the experience of it. You let me know when you're feeling the feeling of it. Got it? And be strong. Sure enough. Can you feel that? It's real dramatic over here. So she's going very weak to that feeling. I don't have to know what it is, but I can tell it stresses her. It's real easy. We're using this as a stress detector. And the final one is to set up a yes or no communication system. This can be done very simply. All I want you to do in your mind silently is just repeat the word yes over and over and over in your head. So just listen to it silently. Mm -hmm. And be strong as I press. Good. Repeat the word no. Hear that over and over. And be real strong. Feel the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see a little bit of her movement? Because she's moving and that arm is dropping real easily and I'm pressing very gently. This isn't a wrestling match. I mean, some muscle testers just want to yank on your arm and they got all kinds of agendas and stuff. It isn't about that. It's just pressing hard enough on the arm to detect whether the muscle locks in place or unlocks. Because as long as you're getting strong and weak responses and your intention is clear about what you're testing, you have a really powerful internal communication system going on here. So let me propose the following. Given our seating arrangement, I want to suggest this. Instead of standing like I'm standing with Juliana this way, I want you to, in a minute, you'll be standing up where, you're, where you are, pick a partner that you're close to, and, and actually stand facing me and have your arm come out towards the back of the chair in front of you. Stand to the side like this, that way we don't hurt anybody. Because <laughs> your arm's coming out this way, not to your side. There's not much room to the side. You're going to have your partner do the following thing. I just want you to use the truth detector for right now, just to have this experience. The way this happens is this. You're going to take your hand, put it gently on top of the wrist, not on the hand that bends here, but on the bone up here. Your other hand, just rest it gently on the, on the shoulder of your partner. They are to be looking, their face is straight, but their eyes are looking down. If your eyes are looking down, you will be emotionally connected to the statement you're making. If your eyes move around, this may not work for you, so this is very important. Head straight, 
chin parallel to the ground, eyes focused down, and then have your partner say, my name is, and use your real name. So one more time, Juliana. My name is Juliana. And be strong. And I want you to say be strong just before you press, okay, to warn the partners. Because if you just jerk like that or you start pressing when they're not ready, you can't tell when the muscle's strong or weak. So let's switch gears. We'll make you somebody else again. This time you can be some guy named Jim. Imagine you're Jim. Say, my name is Jim. My name is Jim. Strong, Jim. You feel a difference. Yeah, it's really dramatic and you just press gently. I want you to have this experience because after a little while I'm going to use this muscle testing connection to demonstrate one of the belief change processes. So take about, it will be more than two to five minutes at the most. I'll yell at you after a while, but I'd like you to have the experience both ways of doing muscle testing this way and just see, what, see how it turns out. Thank you very much, Thank Juliana. You. Go ahead. Going okay? Yeah. I went over a little bit, but not too much. Five or ten minutes. It's okay. Anybody else looking for a partner? Remember to focus your eyes down. Look down at the carpet. Okay, and when you've finished, have a seat. When you've finished the experience, have a seat, and I'll know you're getting ready.